There are hundreds of geometry nodes in Blender. In fact, if you see this map that shows all of the nodes in Blender 3.5, you can see the full extent of the tool. We're gonna take baby steps and start with your first five nodes, so if you don't know absolutely anything about geometry nodes, this is a good place to start. I'm Dude Blender, and let's jump right in. Let's jump into our geometry nodes workspace, add a plane, with the plane selected, add a new node tree, and we'll rename that to test. The first node to learn, and I'm gonna cheat a little bit and bundle these two together, are the group input and output nodes. The group input contains the geometry that is passed to the modifier in the stack, while the group output is the geometry passed to the next modifier. If I go to the modifier properties, you will see that the node tree exists within a geometry nodes modifier that works like any other. I'm gonna very quickly add an extrude mesh node and a subdivision surface modifier to show you. I'm gonna pin this so that we can always see the node tree. And now if I have the subdivision modifier first, then I get this shape because it's subdividing the plane first and then performing the extrusion that we have in our node tree. If I change the order so that the geometry nodes modifier is first, then I get this shape because it's extruding first and then applying the subdivision modifier. As with any other modifier, you can turn it on and off here. I'm gonna delete the subdivision modifier because we don't need it. And there are a couple of things that make the group input node particularly powerful. The first is that you can connect inputs of other nodes to this empty socket, which will allow you to control that value directly from the modifier stack. For example, if I connect the offset scale, you'll see that this socket takes the name of that input. You can also see that the value appears in the modifier panel. And from here I can change it like any other value from any other modifier. The cool thing about it is that if I don't have any geometry nodes editor in my workspace, I can just go to the modifier properties and change that value directly here. There's no need to go into the node tree. You can add any number of parameters that you want. Whenever you connect something, it will create a new empty socket. Now, if in the geometry Geometry Nodes Editor, you press N and go to the Group tab, you can see these outputs and change some of their properties. If I select the Offset Scale socket here, I can see its current properties. By default, the type of data that it takes is a float, but if I want to, I can change that to Integer. Now you'll see that it can only take that type of data. Even if I type 1.5, it will round it to 2. Here you can add a description and it will show whenever you're hovering on the socket or on the value box. That makes it easier for you to remember what this does, or if you're sharing your file with someone else. Here you can change the default, minimum and maximum values. Doing that clamps the value whenever you're dragging with the mouse. However, it still allows you to type a number outside of that range. The second thing to know is that you can add any number of group input nodes within your node tree. You can duplicate this or shift A, input, group, group input, and you can add it to the tree. Of course, in a very simple tree like this one, this might not be useful, but when you start making complex trees, it can help you tidy everything up. Also, if you don't need this geometry, you can safely delete the node. You're not required to have it on your tree at all, and everything else will work. Now, why would you want to delete it, you ask? Well, that's a great segue to our next node. I'm also gonna cheat here and bundle a few nodes, since they all do the same thing. Shift A, Mesh, Primitives, will show you a list of the primitive meshes that you can add to the node tree. You'll often want to create a geometry from scratch. So let's add a, there's no plane, here it's called a grid, and connect that to the group output. I don't need this anymore so I can delete it by selecting it and pressing X. And even when we removed our group input, the offset scale value still remains. Of course, changing this won't do anything at all because there is no logic that uses that value anymore. So we can go here and to keep everything clean we can just delete this by clicking on this minus button. Now we have a grid with this size and this number of vertices. Now remember that this is a modifier. If I tab into edit mode, you'll see that the information of the original plane is still there. It's just invisible now because our modifier is disregarding that data. Let's go to wireframe mode and I'm gonna move this a little bit away from the axis line so that we can see the structure of our grid. We can confirm that it in fact has one, two, three vertices per side. I can change that here and I can also change the size. This is what we call a non-destructive workflow. If I created a grid in the traditional way by adding a plane and subdividing it, this is hard set. There is no immediate way for me to add one more row. I could, for example, extrude this side, but now I've changed the size, so I would need to rescale everything. 
However, with the non-destructive workflow, I can change that at any point during the process. Now let's do something to the meshes. I'm gonna add a cube. Once you know what node you're looking for, shift A and just start typing the name, cube. You can either highlight it with the arrows and press enter or click on it. Next, we'll add our third node, the transform geometry node. So shift A, geometry, operations, transform geometry, and plug it here. If you click on the connection, it automatically connects the sockets. But if not, you can just connect it manually. By the way, control right click and drag to cut any connections. I don't need the grid anymore, so I'm going to delete it and I'm going to connect the cube. The transform geometry node can perform any of the three basic transformations, translation, rotation or scale to your mesh. Note one thing though, if I move the cube, the origin of the object remains in the same place. You'll see that the nodes contain several input sockets. Sometimes we want to control these values simultaneously. Let's say that I wanted to change the scale and the translation simultaneously. Instead of manually changing each value, I can add a node that controls everything. As usual, I'm gonna cheat again and show you different value nodes. Shift A, input, constant, and this is the list of the constant values that you can add to the tree. They're all the exact same except for the type of value that they can contain. So let's add an integer. I'm gonna place that here. I can connect this node to the scale and translation sockets. Note that sockets can have different colors and shapes, which is pretty important, so I have a video about that if you want to watch later. But for now, let's just ignore all of that. Now, if I change the value, it will affect both the scale and the translation at the same time. Now, I'm going to change the constant to a float. Now let's say that I want the scaling to be slower than the translation. It's growing too fast, but I don't want to have two separate controls. We can do that with our last node for the video, the math node. This node is extremely useful, so I made a whole video showing what it does. The basic idea is that it allows you to perform math operations like adding, multiplying or comparing two values and much more. Shift A, utilities, math, math. This node contains all of the functions. Since we want to make the scale value smaller than the translation, we're going to divide it. So we're going to change this from add to divide. Now we can just connect it here and change the value to 2. So what this node is now doing is taking this number and dividing it by 2. And now if I change this value, I can control both parameters. You'll see that it's not scaling as much as before. I could even change that further to 5 and now it's scaling even slower. I'm going to leave it at 2. Now I don't want the cube to be going beyond the screen, so I'm gonna select this math node, shift D to duplicate it, and I'm gonna connect it here now. Let's reorganize this, and I'm gonna change this from divide to ping pong. I'm gonna change the scale to 3. Now if I change the value, you'll see that it goes back and forth. Now I don't want it to grow forever, so I'm just gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna duplicate the ping pong node, connect it here, and I'm gonna change the scale to 1.5. Now again, if I change the value, it's growing and shrinking and going back and forth. And all of that is being controlled by one single value. Now with this movement, a sphere would make more sense. So we can just go ahead and delete the cube, add a UV sphere and connect that to the transform geometry node. I'm gonna go to solid mode. And again, if I change the value, we can see our sphere going back and forth. And now just like that, we have the same movement, but now with a sphere. Oh, but you want a monkey to do that? I accept that challenge. You'll see that if we go to mesh primitives, there's no monkey primitive in the geometry node, so check this out. Let's go back to the viewport and add a monkey. And move this a little bit to the right. Now let's add a geometry nodes modifier. From this drop down, we can select the node trees that we've already created in our scene. So I'm gonna select test, the one that we just created. You'll see that the monkey has disappeared. And that's because we're adding the exact same node tree that removes the group input and uses a UV sphere instead. I'm going to unpin this and you'll see that this icon and this icon are the same but they actually do two different things. This one here creates a new node group and this one here copies the node tree. You'll see that it adds 0.001 so that there are unique names and assigns this node tree to this shape. If I click here you'll see that we now have two different node trees in our scene and we can modify them independently. So now we don't need the UV sphere so I'm gonna delete it. I'm gonna bring back the group input node and remember that this this node contains whatever geometry is being passed to the modifier. So for this object, that geometry is the monkey. So I'm going to connect this to the transform geometry node and now we have our monkey here. I'm just going to clear this rotation and now if I change the value, we have 
one crazy monkey. Now, since I duplicated the node tree, the original one is still intact. This one still has the UV sphere, and that's a cool thing about nodes. Everything is reusable, and everything can be edited, changed, modified at any point in the process. Most impressive. And that's it for this video on Dude Blender. Happy blending.